It was just three weeks before our 27th wedding anniversary. That was eight years ago. And in six days, we'd be celebrating Dina's birthday, five days my birthday, and four days we were scheduled to leave for a deluxe luxury vacation in Cozumel, Mexico to celebrate it all. I had two frequent flyer tickets. That's about the only way we can afford to travel like that. And my father-in-law had a timeshare, which he didn't use that year. He gave it to us, and we booked one week in a luxury resort on the southern tip of Cozumel, just minutes from some of the finest scuba diving in the world. It's like going to Mecca. It doesn't get any better than that this side of heaven. It was a Wednesday four days before we were going to leave. And then to top it all off, just shortly after we got back home, we were off to Bozeman, Montana to do a Revelation Now meeting. Montana, one of our favorite places to go, Bozeman, is at the top of the list. So, I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. We were riding on the crest of the wave, celebrating it all. We stopped at the dive shop to pick up our equipment we had taken in to get cleaned and checked out. And on the way back home, we had a quick stop to make at the doctor's office because Dina had a little simple procedure done on her neck and she needed to get some stitches out but the doctor said don't worry those stitches aren't going to stop her from being able to dive so we're sitting there in the doctor's office waiting he comes in with a clipboard in his hand looking down at the floor not even looking us in the eye shaking his head saying I'm sorry I was wrong but Dina has cancer. It's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he said, the good news is that if you're going to get a cancer, this is the one that you want to get. We caught it early, stage one, and we can cure it. It's curable. I said, well, we're going to Cozumel, Mexico in four days. He said, well, you really need to stay home and get started with the testing. You shouldn't go. But in a couple of weeks, we're going to Bozeman, Montana to do a Revelation Now meeting, and she's going to be gone for four weeks, five weeks. She's not going to be able to go. She needs to stay and start her treatment. We caught it early, but we need to start the treatment. And instantly, our whole world was totally changed. Canceled a vacation, booked a couple of nights in a little motel just outside of Mount Rainier in Packwood, Washington. Dina loves that mountain. And we just needed some time to talk about it, process. What are we going to do now? And one of the things I had to deal with was why. Why did God let Dina get cancer? She spent her whole life serving him we had spent 27 years on the road living in, in RVs and sometimes dismal motels, jungle huts, unbearable heat, humidity, mosquitoes, fighting amoebas and all other kinds of diseases nearly dying in the jungles. Why Dina? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? It's not that we're so good, but at least we're trying. A lot of people aren't even trying. And they seem to get a free ride. 
But I didn't give up my faith. I read that text in James over and over again. If anyone is sick, let him call the elders, anoint them with oil and pray, and God will heal. And I believed that. I clung to that promise. And so we got home. I called all my pastor friends, and I said, look, you guys need to come over to our house, and we need to do it now because they're going to start the testing. And I wanted to have that prayer first because I knew that God would answer that prayer, and when the doctors did their testing, the results would come back, and it would be clean. There would be no problems so we came together they anointed her with oil we prayed and went to begin the testing and the results came back we were wrong I knew it it's not stage one it's stage four and there's no cure and there's no treatment radiation won't work because it's widespread it's in her bones now there's no chemo that will cover it, so there is a new drug. It's called Rituxan. You may want to try it, but we don't have a lot of information on it yet. Why? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? So open your Bibles, Revelation chapter 12. Verse 17, the dragon was angry at the woman and he went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The dragon is at war against those who want to be obedient to the commandments of God and cling to the cross of Jesus Christ. The reason that bad things happen to good people is because the dragon is attacking those who want to be good people. Don't miss the connection here. The dragon is at war with the last of God's people on this earth. This is the final chapter, the final unfolding of this battle between good and evil. And notice again, don't miss this, he is at war with those who want to obey God's commandments and cling to the testimony of Jesus. There's something about the commandments of God that arouses the wrath of the dragon that he turns against them and those who want to obey them. That's the reason that bad things happen to good people. It's because the dragon is at war with those who want to be good people. But that doesn't answer the question as to why does God allow it. He could prevent the dragon from attacking the people of God. He could put a hedge around everyone who wants to be good and do right and say, dragon, you can't get through the hedge. So why does God allow it? And in order to answer that question, we're going to have to go a lot deeper into the Bible. I hope you did your homework and you read the 12th chapter of Revelation because we're going to go deep into the Word of God. Fasten your seatbelts. Hold on for dear life. Start with chapter 12, verse 1. A great and wonderful sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant cried out in pain as she was about to give birth, and then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them down to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who would rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Three characters in this prophecy. A dragon, a woman, and a male child, her son. And we need to identify all three of those characters if we're ever going to understand Revelation because they are central to the book of Revelation. Now, I could tell you right now who they are, but remember our principles of interpretation. So let's review our three keys. Number one, 
the book of Revelation begins with the words, the revelation of whom? Jesus Christ. So all of the prophecies must center in and focus on Jesus Christ. That's number one. Number two, the book of Revelation quotes or alludes to the Old Testament in the Bible over how many times? You got it, 600 times. So that means we have to have a foundation in the Old Testament before we can ever understand Revelation. You're going to see that one just loud and clear. And then number three, no private interpretation will do, but we know, we want to know the interpretation that God intended for us to have. And the only way we can do that is to let Scripture interpret itself. So how do you let the Scripture interpret itself? Tell me. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Find places in the Bible that talk about those same things and line them all up and they will all point to the solution that is Jesus Christ. Now, the fourth key, and we find that again in Revelation chapter 1, the first few verses. Look at it with me. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testified to everything that he saw. Now the words he made it known in Greek actually mean that he signified it. That's the way the King James translates it. Or the actual Greek means he symbolized it. So the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus which is to show us what must soon take place to signify or to symbolize what must soon take place. So the book of Revelation predicts the future but it does it by using symbols. That means, number four, that in order to understand Revelation you have to recognize it is a symbolic book and you have to interpret the symbols and not try to understand it literally. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, in the chapter we're studying right now, in Revelation 12, we discover a great red dragon in the heavens. Well, literally, that would mean that one day you would walk outside of your house, look up into the sky, and see a big red dragon floating around with seven heads and ten horns. But you're never going to look up into the sky and see a big red dragon because it is a symbol, not a literal description of what's going to happen. Are you following me on that? All right? So it's symbolic. Now, how do you interpret the symbols? Because in order to get revelation, you have to break the code and interpret the symbols. How do you do it? And know you're doing it right. Number three, no private interpretation. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Now, let's put those four keys to work and you're going to see how powerful it is, a tool to help you understand the book of Revelation. I'm going to start with the easiest of the three. The easiest one is the dragon. Now, I could tell you the dragon symbolizes the devil. And you could believe that or you could choose not to believe that because that's just me talking. And you don't have to believe every man it's dangerous to follow a man. So instead of just believing what I say, let's compare Scripture with Scripture. Easy to do. You don't have to go very far. Just turn to verse 9. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. Now the Bible says the dragon is a symbol for Satan. Therefore, you have to believe that if you want to believe the Bible. See how easy it is? Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Now, that was an easy one. You probably knew that already before we did it. Let's turn to one that's a little more difficult, and that's the child, the male child. I see four identifying marks. First of all, it's a male, a son. The second one, the dragon tries to devour this child the moment it was born. And on the third one, he was snatched up to God into his throne. And the fourth one is that he would rule all the nations with an iron rod, like the King James says, or an iron scepter in the NIV. Four identifying marks. Now, I believe that that male child is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the center of all the prophecies. But you see, you don't have to believe that because that's just me telling you my interpretation. 
A lot of people teach that it cannot be Jesus Christ because the Bible says he rules with an iron rod. And Jesus wouldn't rule with an iron rod. He rules with love. Well, that makes sense. But does it square up with the Scripture? That's the question. Does it square up with Scripture? So let's identify who is this child, this male child. It says he was a male. Jesus was a male. That one fits. It says the dragon tried to devour him the moment he was born. The dragon is the devil. We've already identified that. Satan, he tried to devour this child. Now remember, the dragon is Satan, but Satan never works as Satan. He never works as the devil. He doesn't go running around in his little red jumpsuit, two horns on his head, long tail, arrow on end, pitchfork in his hand. He appears masqueraded as an angel of light. He works through human instruments. This time, the pagan Roman king Herod. The Roman king Herod, remember when he discovered that the child was born, issued a decree in the book of Matthew chapter 2 that all baby boys under the age of 2 would be put to death trying to devour that child the moment it was born. So the male child fits, the dragon trying to devour him fits. He was snatched up to God and to his throne. That one fits because Jesus was caught up to God and to his throne. Amen? Amen. But what about that iron rod? It says, he will rule the nations with an iron rod. Hold your place. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation, the 19th chapter, verse 11, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one but he himself knows. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God. Who's that? Jesus Christ. And just in case you're not sure, look at verse 16. On his robe and on his thigh he had this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's Jesus Christ. Amen? The rider on the white horse is Jesus Christ. But watch, I skip verse 15. Verse 15 says, Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. So Jesus does rule with an iron scepter. What does that mean? The only way to really understand that is to go back, because it's quoting the Old Testament. That's right, quoting Old Testament Psalm chapter 2 in the second Psalm, which is a song that was written anticipating that the Messiah was going to come. And they would sing this song looking forward to the appearance of the Messiah. And listen to what it says. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, He said to me, You are my son, today I've become your father, Ask of me, and I'll make the nations your inheritance, the end of the earth your possession. Now watch. You will rule them with an iron scepter, and you will dash them to pieces like pottery. So Jesus does rule with an iron scepter. He smashes the nations to pieces like pottery. And furthermore, we saw that, remember, Nebuchadnezzar's image representing the nations of the world was smashed to pieces by the stone symbolizing Jesus Christ when he comes to establish God's kingdom forever. So all of the identifying marks match up when you compare Scripture with Scripture. You cannot escape the conclusion that that male child, that son that the woman bore is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And he takes his place in the center of the prophecy, just like we saw in our principles of Revelation. Now we've come to the third one. That's the woman. I saved it till last because the woman is the most difficult to understand. Women are usually difficult to understand, <laughs> at least for us men. I mean, you may understand each other, but uh, my wife keeps telling me I shouldn't say that. It's not politically correct anymore. May not be, it's still true. <laughs> Who is the woman? There's a clue right here in this chapter. Verse 9, 
the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So the dragon was hurled down. Who's the dragon? That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. So you tell me now, where in the Bible can you find a story about an ancient serpent and the woman? <laughs> right. Genesis chapter 3. So let's go there. Genesis, the third chapter. You see, the last Bible book points us all the way back to the first Bible book. You can't understand Revelation without the Old Testament. Genesis, the third chapter. Here's the setting. Genesis 3. God had just created the world, the garden, beautiful garden of Eden, put the man and the woman in the garden, and he told them, I've given you all these trees, all these trees, and you can eat all of them except for that one tree right in the middle of the garden. If you eat from that one, you're going to die. Now, is there anything complicated about that? Is that hard to understand? You can eat from any tree except that one. If you eat from that one, you're going to die. Crystal clear. God is always crystal clear. People ask me, why does God make things so confusing? He doesn't. He made it clear. Now, the serpent comes along, and he says to the woman, chapter 3, verse 1, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said, verse 3, God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And if you do, you will die. And the serpent said, you won't die. But your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, I want to stop here for a second because these verses are loaded and packed with profound thoughts that we need to understand. How did Adam and Eve know that if they would eat from that tree, they would die? Did they do a scientific analysis of the fruit and discover it was poisonous? No. How did they know? Because God said, if you eat it, you're going to die. You see, the way they knew good from evil was to trust what God said. It's simple. But you have to trust God. In other words, please get this, in other words, there was an external standard of absolute right and wrong. It was not within them, but it was within God. God was the one who defined and decided what is right and what is wrong. It is an absolute standard of truth, and that truth is outside of us. It's in God. And the only way we can know what's right or wrong or good or best is to trust God's Word. That's all that Adam and Eve had to do. But watch what happened. She got up to the tree. Have you ever wondered, why did God put that tree there? You ever wondered that? Wouldn't it have been better if he just said, eat any tree you want? Why did he put that tree there? So she went up to the tree. And that was her first mistake. If God says that something isn't good, we should get as far away from it as we can, not try to get as close as we can to it. Amen. What was she doing under the tree? If she would have stayed away, we wouldn't be in this mess we're in today. But she's under the tree. So that gave the dragon an opportunity. He appears as a serpent, a beautiful serpent. He was beautiful then. And he said to the woman, Did God say if you eat the fruit you're going to die? You won't die. You won't. You eat it. You'll be, you'll be like God. You'll know good from evil yourself. You see, you won't need God to tell you what is right or wrong. You can decide just like he does. You will be like God. 
Now watch this. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. How did she decide that it was okay to eat? She listened to the serpent. She looked at it. It looked desirable. It seemed good. So instead of relying on what God said to know right and wrong, she relied on her own human perceptions to do what seemed like the right thing to her. This was a huge, what, what we call paradigm shift from the paradigm of an external absolute truth in God to an internal deciding for yourself what seems to be right and good and best to you. Can you see what we're doing here? Can you see what she did here? And if you understand that shift, then you can begin to understand what's happening in this old world today. I couldn't help but jot this down. I was watching O'Reilly Factor one time. And he is interviewing Dan Rather, a noted newsman. Dan Rather said, I think you can be an honest person and lie about any number of things. <laughs> See, that's exactly what we're talking about. The question isn't what is right and wrong. The question is what seems right or wrong to you is okay. If it seems right, do it. If it seems wrong, don't do it. Not what is right because what is right is what God says. I remember one time when a president of the United States found himself in difficulty and he was being challenged that he had done something wrong and another person said he had done it. He said he didn't and he was about to be impeached for it and they had him on Sam and Koki, Sam, Sam Donaldson and Koki Roberts in news interview. Some of you may, may remember them and they were interviewing him and uh, Koki Roberts asked, the, not the president, but his, his chief counsel was there and asked him, now, now she said he did and he said he didn't. One of them has to be lying, right? And the chief attorney to the president of the United States said no. And Koki Roberts said, huh? <laughs> I mean, she said he did. He said he didn't. And what, one of them's not lying? She says, even our school children know that somebody has to be lying here. What are we teaching our children? Good question. But finally, Susan Page, who is the editor of USA Today, after they'd been debating back and forth, you know, what the president should do, Susan Page said, well, in the end, he's going to have to do what seems right to him. Wrong. What she should have said was, in the end, he's going to have to do what is right. It's not what seems right that's right. It's what is right that's right. And what is right is what comes from the Word of God. And that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. And that's the battle that unfolds in the last days. It's over the difference between what is right and what seems right. And that's why he attacks those who want to be obedient to God's commands. Are you beginning to put it all together? So now what is God going to do? He's got a problem. He said, if you eat the fruit, you're going to die. And they ate the fruit, but he doesn't want them to die. He loves them. But how can he be telling the truth when he says, if you eat the fruit, you're going to die and allow them to live? You see, that was God's dilemma. Well, he had a solution. And we find it in verse 15. He tells the serpent, I will put enmity. That means conflict war. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers and he will crush your head but you will strike his heel. Now what is he talking about here? He's talking to a serpent and offspring of the serpent that they would bite the heel of the offspring of the woman but that wouldn't be the end because the offspring of the woman is going to crush his head. Now, he's not talking about little baby snakes running around on the ground when he says offspring of the serpent. 
the serpent is the devil, the offspring of the, of the serpent are those who choose to follow the devil. Well, who is the offspring of the woman? Who is the woman? The woman's offspring is the one who delivers the death blow to the head of the serpent. And therefore, this prophecy is telling us that there will be a conflict between those who follow Satan and those who choose to follow God or Jesus Christ. And Jesus is going to get a bite on the heel. He died on the cross, but praise the Lord, three days later he was raised up again and caught up to the throne of God. One of these days he's going to come back and deliver the death blow to crush the head of the serpent. Now listen to me. All the rest of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is unpacking this one prophecy. This is the first prophecy in the Bible. And all the rest of the Bible is unpacking this one prophecy. How is the seed of the woman going to deliver the death blow to the head of the serpent? And we find that bringing, bringing it to its exciting climax in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, the dragon was angry at the woman and he went off to make war against the remnant or the last of her offspring on this earth, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. All the rest of the Bible is unpacking that prophecy that began in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 15, in order to fully understand this prophecy, we have to know a little more. We have to know the issues that were involved. The Bible tells us, verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought back. He was not strong enough. They lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil of Satan. He leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Don't be afraid of the bad spirits because for every demon spirit, God has two good ones. His tail only swept a third of the stars down from the sky. There are two-thirds left. But why? What was this war about in heaven? What were they fighting over? What was the issue? The revelation doesn't clearly tell us here, but the Old Testament does. Isaiah chapter 14. Open your Bibles now to Isaiah the 14th chapter. And we'll discover, verse 12, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, or Lucifer, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Doesn't that sound like revelation? See, he was hurled down to the earth. He was in heaven, hurled down to the earth. Why? Here it is, verse 13. Because you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Somebody said the only thing wrong with that Lucifer was he had eye problems. <laughs> See, God created this perfect angel, but he spent a little too much time one day looking in the mirror I'm going to take credit for all the beauty and all the wisdom that he had to himself and rebelled against God. Now, what was the issue? What was going on here? I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned. Now, the throne is the seat of government. And the heart of every government is its law. So Lucifer was challenging God's government. He was challenging God's law. That's why he's angry at those who want to be obedient to the commandments of God. He was saying, look, God's the one who makes all the rules around here. He doesn't include us. He's never had a meeting with me or you or any of the others to try to tell us why or what. He just tells us what to do. We have to do it. Put me on the throne. I'll show you. We can have some fun around this place. He was challenging God's rule. He was challenging God's law, God's government. He didn't realize that God's laws are laws of love. And when we understand what the laws are, then we can understand love. And the beauty of love is never revealed until we understand the beauty of God's law. God has lots of different kinds of laws. Lucifer just forgot about this. 
God has physical laws. The whole universe is governed by laws. The law of gravity, the law of centrifugal force, the law of centripetal force, the law of thermodynamics, all kinds of laws. And if any one of those laws that holds the whole universe together, if any one of those laws is broken, the whole thing is going to crash. God's laws are laws of love. And he created the man and the woman. He created us and put within us certain laws by which we would operate and function. And when we lived our lives within the circle of the laws that God gave for us, we would be happy. We would have peace. We would have joy. Everything would be perfect. But if we step outside of those laws that God made for us to live by, then bad things are going to happen to us. We're going to break, and other people are going to get hurt in the process. It's not like God said, here are my laws. Do them, or I'm going to zap you. No. He's saying, here's the way I made you. And if you live like this, you are going to experience life far beyond anything you can ever imagine. But if you don't trust me and you try to step outside of the circle, you're going to suffer. And other people are going to get hurt. That's what it's all about. It's like God's owner's manual. He's telling us, here's how I made you. Now, you can buy a new car and look in the owner's manual and it says you've got to put oil in the crankcase. And you say, well, that's what it says, but I think I will do it my way. Seems better to me and it seems a lot cheaper to put water in there instead of oil and it will save the planet. So you put water in the crankcase. Now, you can do that, but your car is going to break. And God says, here, how, here's how I made you. Here's the way you're going to work. Here's the grease that keeps things smooth for you. physical laws. Here's the way I made your body to function. There are certain things that you put into it that are not going to help you. You need a lot of water. You need some good food, the right kinds of food. If you put the wrong things in, it's like putting water in the crankcase. You're going to break, and you're going to hurt, and you're going to suffer. You see, that's the way God made us. There are social laws. God teaches us how to relate to each other, how to love each other. The Bible says we should honor our parents. Wouldn't you love to live in a place where everybody did that? Not to lie, not to steal, not to kill. Wouldn't you like to live in a world like that? Not to commit adultery. He said, I made you. So the man would leave his father and mother cleaving to his wife and the two would become one. And if you stay like that, you're going to be happy. But if you try to get outside of that circle, you're going to hurt and other people are going to get hurt in the process. See, that's what God's law is about. It's about love, how to love each other. Do I love my neighbor? If I say, hallelujah, neighbor, praise the Lord, my brother, I love you, I'm slipping his wallet out of his pocket. Is that love? Does a man love his neighbor if he's having an affair with his neighbor's wife? You see, that isn't love. I, I was on a plane one day going to Chicago for a a meeting and when I get on the plane I always like to pray Lord please put me next to somebody that I can witness to so don't ever sit next to me on the plane unless you want to talk about the Lord <laughs> and so I prayed and got on the plane sitting there and sure enough this lady comes attractive looking like I mean she looked like she had a presence about it. she was somebody not an ordinary person and when I was talking to her, I could tell, well, this is an educated lady, you know. And I asked her, well, what do you do? She said, well, I'm a social worker in New York City, and I'm the director of this large children's program. She had a Ph.D. in sociology. I mean, she had it all together there. And then I asked her, well, what does your husband do? She said, oh, my husband's archaeology. He has his two Ph.D.s in archaeology. I mean, well, this is quite a couple. And I kept asking her about what you do and what he does, and, what the, and finally she got the hint. And she said, well, what do you do? <laughs> I said, oh, I'm an evangelist. She says, evangelist. She says, What's that? PhD. What's evangelist? 
I said, well, I travel around the different churches and I do seminars on Revelation, kind of like having revivals. Oh, oh, nice. And I said, you know, you believe her? She said, no, actually, we're both atheists. And I said, oh, okay. I said, can I ask you something? She said, sure. And I can tell that you're a social worker, you're in charge of this big children's program in New York City, and you love children. Am I right? Oh, yeah, I love those children. I said, well, suppose you have two little boys, they're in a group, and, and they come, and one of them has two $5 bills, he shows everybody and sticks them in his pocket, and the other little boy sees it, and he says, you know, I haven't had anything to eat in three days. We're so poor, we don't have any food. I am hungry. If I had one of those $5 bills, I'd like to buy some bread and some food for my family. Could I have one? And the little boy says, no, that's my money, and puts it in his pocket. But while they're resting, taking a nap, the little fella sneaks over there and slips one of those $5 bills out of his pocket. I said, you see that. Would that be okay with you? She said, no. I said, why not? She said, because that's wrong. And I said, I know, but uh, why would it be wrong? She says, because that's stealing. I said, well, I know. But um, why is stealing wrong? And she said, you know, it's going to help his family and his friends. Why is stealing wrong? She said, I don't think I can answer that. I said, can I ask you another question? She goes, I guess. <laughs> I can tell you really love your husband, right? Oh, yeah, I love my Well, suppose he has a secretary, and her husband's an abuser, alcoholic, beats her up, beats the kids. She is at the end of her road. She tells you, she says, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just ready to just take some pills and die. I can't face life anymore. Man, you're so lucky. If I had a husband like yours, I could make it. In fact, if I could just have him one night a week, I think I could get by the rest of the six others. Could I have your husband just one night a week? I said, well, what would you tell her? She would say, no. I said, well, why not? If it would help her out, well, he's my husband. I said, well, I know he's your husband, but you'd get him six nights. He only wants one. <laughs> why wouldn't you? She said, that's wrong. I said, I know. I know it's wrong, but tell me, why is it wrong? And she said, you keep asking me questions that I can't answer. You see, there is no answer unless you believe in the Word of God. I said, I can tell you why it's wrong. Do you want to know? She says, why? Because God made the man and the woman. And he said the man will leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and the two become one flesh. And that's the way that you're going to be happy. And that's the only way that you can say that it's wrong. If you don't believe that, you have no standard of right and wrong. And that's why we have such a problem in this world today. God's laws are laws of love. And when we break them, we break and things happen and people get hurt. God has other kinds of laws, spiritual laws that teach us how to love him. He says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He says that we shouldn't take his name in vain. He says we shouldn't bow down and worship idols. You see, the last six of the Ten Commandments teach us how to love each other. First four teach us how to love God. Do you love God if you have idols and pray to idols? Well, nobody does that today. Well, maybe we don't carve them out of wood and gold and stone and bow down and pray to them, but a lot of people have one-eyed idols in their living rooms. We're watching 22 men move a little piece of leather pigskin up and down a 100-yard piece of grass. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that, that it's wrong. You know, my VCR gets all that, and I can watch it after the meeting. <laughs> So don't tell me the scores. <laughs> but the point is, anything that comes in between us and God can become an idol. A big new house, a big car, fancy clothes, anything. Can, our money can be an idol, but it can also be put to good use. So can a TV set. Revelation Now is going to be on TV. 
So whatever stands between us and God becomes an idol. There's another kind of idol, a sophisticated form of idolatry. A God of our own creation, a God of our own imagination, a God who approves of the things that we like and condemns the things we don't like. They call it relativism, existentialism, doing your own thing, finding yourself, postmodernism, all kinds of names. But the Bible calls it sin. You're like sheep that have gone astray, each to his own way, each doing what seems right to you. The problem is what seems right is not always the same as what is right. And the only way to know what is right is to trust God. The Bible tells us, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Some people in the end are going to be lost doing what seems right to them. The way of a fool seems right in his own eyes. We can't always trust reason. In Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah 55, verse 8, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than yours. We can't always figure out what's right and wrong because God sees and knows things that we haven't even begun to understand yet. And we need to trust him. I'm not saying that there's no room for us to think. God said, come, let us reason together. We think, we decide, we plan, we do things. But in the end, we have to come to the bottom line conclusion that God made us, he knows what's best for us, and we trust him even if it doesn't seem right to us. When Lucifer first sinned in heaven, God had some options. One of the options was that he could have just zapped him he could have rubbed him out right then. But think about it. If he did, it was Lucifer trying to win all these angels to following him, saying that God isn't fair, that God never allows you to voice your opinions as to how things should be run. And then while he's talking to the angels, telling them God isn't fair, God walks in and zap, there goes Lucifer. Now, how would you feel about God? You'd be going, whoa. Whoa. We better walk the line around here. Who's next? And everybody would be worshiping God out of fear instead of love. But God is a God of love. He couldn't allow that. So he had another option. And that was to let Lucifer go. Leave him alone. Give him some time to demonstrate what it would really be like if he was in charge, if he got his way. And after he had enough time to demonstrate what sin is really like, then God would be able to destroy Lucifer and sin and those who choose to sin, and everyone would know that he was doing the right thing. So that was the choice that God made. He had to give Lucifer time to demonstrate what would life be like on this planet if he had his way. In the meantime, we suffer because God has to allow Lucifer to remember we're in this circle. And he has to allow Lucifer to step outside of that circle. As long as we're inside the circle and live according to the way God made us, we're not going to hurt. We're going to be happy. We're going to be joyful. But if we step outside the circle, we're going to hurt, and other people are going to be hurt too. So God had to give him time to demonstrate what it's like, and that means that some of us are going to suffer. You remember the story of Job. Read it in the first chapter and the second chapter of Job. Read that. The devil appeared before God and God said, what about my servant Job? See how faithful he is? And the devil says, well, sure he is because every time I try to do something to him, you stop me. You built a hedge around him. You protect him. Let me have at him and you watch. He'll curse you. And so God said, okay, have at him. 
And he did. He, he suffered boils. He lost his home. He lost his family. His wife turned against him, challenging him to turn away from God. He lost everything that he had, yet he stayed faithful to God. God allowed Lucifer, uh, the devil, to attack Job, and Job demonstrated that God is just and God is fair. And then in the end, God gave him. God gave Job back even more than he had before. One of my favorite verses that explains this is in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, Paul writes that God is faithful. Verse 13, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. You see, God does allow the devil to attack us. He allows him to do things that hurt us, but he will never allow him to do anything beyond what we can handle. When we first started, I told you that my wife got cancer, and I really struggled with that, trying to, why did God allow that to happen? The reason he allowed it to happen was because he knew we could handle it. He would never let it happen. He would never let us be tempted beyond what we can bear, and we need to trust God with that. No matter how much the devil comes after us, we need to trust him and know that he's not going to let him do anything that we can't handle. God knew we could handle it. And so he allowed it to happen. You see, he's walking a fine line. He's walking a tightrope. Every, if every time a Christian prayed, God deliver me, God help me, God save me from this, if God answered every prayer the way we want it to be answered, then think about it. Every time he answered a prayer for a Christian, it puts off and delays the time that Jesus can come. And so he lets the devil have just enough rope to demonstrate how wicked he is, and at the same time, he'll never let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And just like Job, God promised him something better, and he gave him something better. The same way for us. One year later, after we found out that my wife had cancer, one year later, we went back in for some more testing, and after her treatments for one year, we found that it was in remission, and there was no trace of the cancer anymore. He gave us a little ray of hope. He gave us some sunshine. And not only that, he threw a bonus on top. He helped us find that little retirement home that we were looking for with a beautiful view of Mount Rainier. Just a little taste of something better. Sin isn't fair. It wasn't fair that she got cancer. It isn't fair that the devil attacks you. Sin is not fair. But God more than makes up for it. You can trust him. That's why bad things happen to good people. The Bible says God made man in his own image. Now, I'm not going to get into the discussion of what all that means theologically, but I think it's enough for us to recognize that there's something about having someone in your own image that makes you love them all the more. And he made us in his image. That's why God created people. So you could have someone to love and to love him back. Love involves other people, but love also involves choice. Our youngest son was only about three years old at the time. And I'll never forget, we lived in an RV, and I had a big Mayflower moving van fixed up and painted and had an office in there, a place to store our stuff, and a place for me to get away and study. You don't study with two little boys in an RV. So I'm sitting in my office studying one day. I had the big van door kind of cracked open just a little bit, and I heard it creak, and then I heard a, uh, a little grunt. I turned around to look, and there was my boy. Big round face, big brown eyes, just sparkling. And he said, Daddy, I love you. Turned around and ran away. <laughs> About to get emotional just telling you that. Because you see, the thing that made his love so precious is that he didn't have to say that. He didn't have to say it. He didn't have to love me. A lot of children don't love their parents. In fact, the time came when he didn't love us. Changed his name, left, didn't want anything to do with us. There's nothing more painful 
than the rejection of the love of one of your own children. And it helped me to understand maybe just a little bit about how God feels when we don't love him. The things started getting a little better. And one day he flew back. He lives in England. He flew back home. And it was Father's Day. And he gave me a card. And it says in the card, Dear Dad, I don't think that this card was manufactured with the intention for sons to give it to their fathers on Father's Day. But the cover picture, even though it's irrelevant, I like the words because that's where we are, I hope. And the words on the cover, to my friend. Best wishes for your whole year, not just this one single day. I don't say enough how much I appreciate you and my childhood. Thank you for giving me a happy and healthy home. In parentheses, transient. Your son. Inside, wishing you one of the best Father's Days you have ever had. And it was because of this card. He didn't have to give me that card. The fact that he didn't have to makes it all the more precious to me. And that's why God put the tree in the garden. He had to give us a choice, even though he knew we would reject him. He had to put the tree there because of love. God could have done other things. He could have said, planet Earth, you made your bed, now sleep in it. He couldn't do that. So God did the unthinkable to that old devil. God became a man and died on the cross to save us. And all we need to do is reach out and take the hand of Jesus. Trust him. Follow him.